All right. So next up, we've got Will McNeil from The Mill. Welcome, Will. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm Will McNeil. I work at The Mill in London, um, although I'm currently working away from The Mill in London. Um, I'm a CG design director, which means I work in our design department, uh, but I tend to work on the design jobs that are more 3D related. So I do a lot of procedural design, procedural animation, do a bit of real time, some stuff for games, stuff for inst installations, and a lot of kind of abstract 3D projects. Cool. Uh, so Houdini at the mill, um, you know, what's the, what's the history there on the, especially on the advertising side, maybe it wasn't uh, as uh, used maybe five years ago, and, and so how did it come in, and where, where is it now? Yeah, well, I mean, the mill's been using Houdini for, I think, over 10 years as a kind of effects tool as part of the CG department. It's only come into the design department probably in the last about four years, and that was a really gradual thing. Um, and it, it happened because projects that we were doing needed kind of more control and more complexity. Um, so it, we started out just using it for creating animations that we would cache and then send back into Cinema 4D for rendering. And then very gradually, this changed into, um, you know, we did more and more of the work inside Houdini. Um, to the point where about a year ago, we started using Houdini as a kind of all-round tool. So we'd be doing everything from uh, modeling, animation, uh, right through kind of whole motion design pipeline. Uh, and then rendering, mainly with Redshift inside Houdini. Excellent. And so um, what are you going to be talking about today in your presentation? Uh, actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, kind of how we started to integrate Houdini into motion design work. And then I'm going to talk about two projects, uh, one of which is um, exactly what you'd probably expect Houdini to be used for. It's a big uh, terrain project that we did, um, that I did, I direct, designed and directed for uh, some IDENs for Al Jazeera television. Yeah. And the other is something that I don't think anyone would expect Houdini to be used for. It's, um, it's a setup I built that uh, kind of simulates oil painting inside Houdini. Uh, it's become a little bit of a hobby of mine, is, is trying to make oil painting inside Houdini. I've seen some of that. It's amazing work. Uh, well, let's jump into the presentation. Okay. Okay. Let's get this started. Uh, hey, I am Will McNeil, and I work uh, in the design department at The Mill in London. I wanted to say a big hello from The Mill. We're unfortunately uh, not standing in front of our offices right now. We're tucked away in our homes, working away. Before I get started with my talk, I just want to point out this talk is about work done by our design team or motion design team, if you want to call it that. We work very closely with the CG and FX teams at the mill, but the work I'm going to show you today tends to be a little bit more focused on concept and emotion rather than like photoreal CG, which you might know the mill for. So what do we do? Well, in some of our recent work, you can see it's mainly sort of 3D abstract stuff. Lots of procedural design, shapes, colors, particles. Uh, we do a lot of graphic design. We even do some graphic design inside Houdini. Um, and the mill has been using Houdini for a long time, uh, mainly in effects work. I think probably for more than 10 years. Uh, in motion design, it's a little bit different. It's something we've picked up more recently. We use it uh, at first to do things like this, where we needed kind of like, you know, vellum simulations and stuff like that. So it really started out with projects where we couldn't do something with our normal tools. So we typically work with something like Cinema 4D and After Effects. And um, so like a project like this one, we were trying to create animation based on bio data uh, taken from someone having a massage. We just couldn't really get there with the tools that we normally use. So um, we moved into Houdini uh, just partially. We just used this to create animation that we would cash out as an Olympic and then take it back into Cinema 4D and render it using uh, Arnold or Redshift or Octane. And um, this is something we use quite a lot. We kind of carried on with this system. So this is an ad we made for Huawei. And this is kind of a, a team effort between the motion design team and the CG team. Um, and again, we're just using Houdini as part of our design tool set to create specific things that we didn't feel we could create properly using our normal tools. So. Um, this kind of gave us a little bit more control, allowed us to build slightly more complex systems. And then this would get cached out and rendered either uh, inside uh, Cinema 4D or actually passed on to our CG teams using Maya at the time. So kind of a, a hybrid uh, effort, I guess you could call it. Uh, this is another spot we did kind of in the more um, standalone design way. This is something we did for View Cinema. 
And again, we just cached a lot of things inside Houdini and then passed them back out into C4D for rendering. And um, we did this for a while. We didn't really know what we were doing. We kind of were figuring it out as we went along. But our colleagues in the CG teams were really helpful and they were, um, exact, in fact, essential in sort of giving us some basic uh, information, but also in um, kind of being excited about the things that we were doing that were different from the stuff that they were typically doing and really wanting to get involved in that as well. The big step came for us with this project we did a, about a year, just over under two years ago, uh, this ident for BBC2, where we decided for the first time to do a project kind of start to finish inside Houdini. And I think obviously the, the sort of visual effects nature of this shot or the, the simulation nature of the shot meant there really wasn't much point in taking it back into another program to render. So our artist, Jessica Tan, she built this whole thing inside Houdini, rendered it out inside there. Got a lot of help from our effects teams in terms of kind of figuring out what kind of pipelines you would need and, and, and whatnot. But generally speaking, this was our first real move into Houdini. It was obviously quite an ambitious thing for us to take on. We've done all kinds of weird stuff in, uh, in Houdini, and this is one of the ones I'm most interested in. It's um, a, a shoe that I was asked to design, a procedural shoe. And um, I think this kind of shows how uh, much using Houdini kind of changed our approach to 3D because once you get into Houdini, you can't really hide from the, the difficult stuff in 3D. You have to kind of understand it. Whereas in a lot of other programs, it kind of, you know, you don't really need to get into the kind of real nitty gritty of stuff. But um, when we started doing stuff like this, just the confidence that we picked up from learning these techniques inside Houdini made such a big difference to us. It meant that we felt, you know, able to take on something as challenging as creating a, an actual shoe that would be eventually 3D printed. So I'm gonna talk in depth about two projects today. Um, the first one is basically a, a terrain project. Um, so that's something that you know Houdini is quite well known for being able to do. And um, I'll show you kind of how that uh, slotted into our design pipeline and, and you know how we made a lot with a very small team. The next project is uh, or more of a hobby really, kind of something I'm working on in my spare time, which is this um, uh, tool called Strokeit, which um, is made for kind of simulating oil painting inside Houdini, um, either you know based on freehand strokes or based on uh, scans of photographs. Um, and I'll show you how that works and kind of how I built that up. What links these two very different things together is that they're procedural. So they are kind of based on a series of instructions rather than on kind of pushing polygons around. And um, for me, a procedural is a, a really cool way of working. And I'll try to show how we exploit that in our projects and it helps us, you know, I think it helps us work faster, but it also helps us create more uh, from the work that we do. So you kind of front load your projects with a lot of initial to the design and, and research, and then you're able to create a lot of cool stuff afterwards. Uh, so um, strap in and we'll get going. The first thing I want to look at is a series of items that we made for a news channel called Al Jazeera. Uh, Al Jazeera English, actually. Uh, I'm going to play a kind of montage of them now, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, how we made them. So we made five of these uh, idents. They're all about 15 seconds long. Four of them are completely CG, uh, made in Houdini and C4D. We had some help with tools like uh, Quixel Megascans, Substance Designer, and Redshift. We wanted to do this with small teams, uh, no more than one lead and one additional designer per film. 
by doing this, we could give artists a chance to really own their films. And the result is we all got kind of attached to our projects, which was pretty cool, actually. Uh, you know, it's something we could you know, kind of design, direct, animate all ourselves. And I think that um, that was made possible in part by the fact that we were using Houdini. So I'm going to show you um, one of them now and talk about um, some of the processes behind making it. This one um, is called diversity, and I'll, I'll explain what that means in a second. So the idea with these idents is that they all represent values of the channel. So as a news channel, we picked up on values like diversity, uh, resilience, uh, raw, meaning kind of un unfiltered real news. Uh, and then we devised these different environments to tell those stories. So the, the physical world represents a kind of metaphor of the world, um, you know, the, the world of society and the news and, and all of that. So in this one, the sand grains represent individual people and you get up really close to them and they all look different. So that was kind of the cool thing there. So you imagine, you know, sand grains just all the same, but actually they're very excitingly different when you see them up close. So we were trying to kind of pig in on that. And then you see them uh, from a great distance and, you know, they've, they make these massive landscapes and shapes. And so it's kind of this, you know, it's a story that uh, the news, the channel encapsulates, you know, the whole world, but you see also every unique voice, every person and opinion is, is given an opportunity to speak. And that was, um, you know, kind of a, a fun thing to work with. These ideas had come from our design team. And so really we, you know, felt some ownership of these right from the very beginning. Technically, like in making these, this posed an interesting challenge on this one is that you have this you know, at one point is really up close macro landscape. And then you have to get out super wide and see, you know, miles and miles at once. So it really requires two very different systems. The up close one, uh, as you can see here, uh, is in a few shots and it really features these unique sand grains. And that was the idea. Um, I'm a very lazy 3D artist and um, often I prefer to build something out of millions of small 3D objects than actually, you know, create the texture maps and the back, um, the map paintings, what I would need to make this. So uh, something like this, I decided when I, I wanted to see these little grains on the ground, that even in the mid distance, I would still make them actual grains uh, rendered as 3D objects. And um, this is not a massive thing to do in Houdini. It's um, Houdini's kind of well set up for this. Um, basically this uses a particle system, which allows all these little grains to sit on the floor. And, uh, and that's uh, as much as Houdini really needs to know until you start to render. And then uh, using an instancing system that feeds into Redshift, and you can see the code for that here, it basically picking uh, for every particle uh, a random piece of geometry out of a group of, um, I think there are 17 that it's picking from in this group, um, picking one of them and then um, sticking that geometry onto the particle at render time. And then other various things are happening, like additional um, randomization of scale and color and rotation um, to make them all feel unique. Um, I said there were 17 of these, but in general, they were really just six. Uh, the, I kind of duplicated and made a, a few alterations, but basically they all come from these six original shapes. So you don't really need loads and loads of these to make them feel different, as long as you can vary the color and, and the shaders a little bit at render time, then um, you can really get this sense of them being, uh, I think the technical term is shitloads of them. Uh, and it worked pretty well. And of course you throw in, you know, uh, shallow focus, bokeh, nice lighting, bit of good comp, and um, they all kind of, um, they all kind of sit in there pretty well. To do the wide shots, we used uh, the height field tool in Houdini. Um, and if you haven't used the height fields, it's, um, essentially built as a terrain system. I'm sure there are other things you can do with it, but in general, it, it works very well as a terrain system. Um, in fact, terrains is something I've played with for a long time. These are something I did uh, years ago using um, a tool called World Machine, then a 
bringing that stuff into Cinema 4D and rendering it with V-Ray. I guess I've just, I'm always been kind of into terrains. Um, I used to live in Colorado actually, where uh, it's pretty much surrounded by mountains. And um, these in fact are the mountains surrounding Boulder, Colorado, where I lived. Um, so I always used to try to kind of come up with ways to uh, to render them in an interesting an interesting way. And I just love mountains. I think they're these kind of, um, you know, testaments to, to time and weather and, um, you know, just this scale of time that's so different from our own lives. I think um, one of the things that's really interesting about the way that you do terrains or height fields in Houdini is, is you kind of do the same thing. You just really speed up time massively. So you start with something that's quite, um, you know, clean and, and simplistic in terms of its surface and then run it through all the terrain processes and you get something that is you know, massively, massively much more complex. And um, you can even actually sort of watch this or animate this process and um, it's quite enjoyable, but you do get up to some file sizes that are probably a little bit big for that. Um, but that's basically the process. You know, you start with something really simple and smooth and then you just kind of erode, 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 add more detail, up res it and, uh, and erode some more. Something I should point out, this, this shape here is based on the Al Jazeera teardrop logo. So it's something that was um, uh, you know, pretty important to get right uh, and really important to them that it felt like it kind of really was there in the, um, in the environment and also that it didn't feel kind of unrealistic. It just needed to kind of, kind of get a sense of the shape and that's about it. We didn't want to kind of make this thing look perfect. So the process I used was to start with ZBrush um, and um, create this sort of tweaked version of the logo form. It's absolutely not essential at all to start in ZBrush. You can start inside Houdini um, or you can bring in uh, height field, uh, TIFF images if you want. There are all kinds of ways you can do this. You can manually build geometry in Houdini. It's all fine. I just chose to do it this way because um, it seemed to be the most um, kind of expressive way to create these shapes. And um, so you bring that in. So, um, oh yeah, and so inside ZBrush, one thing I found really interesting is that normally when you build something in ZBrush, you know, you want the surface to feel pretty achieved. You know, you want everything to feel really well sculpted. Actually, in this case, it's kind of the opposite. The, the rougher and worse that you made that surface look and the more little kind of broken bits you threw in there, the better. It actually, um, all you'll see in this, as this develops, all those little kind of uh, mistakes in there actually turn into quite nice bits of um, geography when they're uh, when it's all eroded. So that comes into Houdini, got it in there as a, a height field. Um, so this is a projected height field on top of um, that object that I just brought in. And you just start uh, eroding it, adding detail, up it, and then repeating that process. So this is the, the first erosion step. And um, you can see I also added some other stuff in the kind of surrounding area, but um, you can already see how it's kind of picked up on some of the details inside the, um, the ZBrush sculpt and just turn those into interesting things. So you kind of get these little rivers and gullies and washes um, <laughs> without doing much work. Uh, and then you up res and you do it again. And, um, you know, as I was going, I was kind of adding a few little kind of custom details, maybe lifting an area up here, lowering it in another place. Um, but generally just letting it kind of do its thing. And then up res and then do it again. And this is um, the point at which I would stop and say, okay, that as far as geometry goes, I don't really need any more detail here. Anything else I'm going to put in for geometry is going to be, um, or for surface is going to be, is going to come from uh, things like displacement and additional objects scattered onto the surface, uh, even bump and just a shader, which I'll show you in a minute. I think one of the coolest parts of this though is the erosion isn't just a way to distort and alter your terrain. It's a way of storing information on the surface. And like so many things in Houdini, a piece of geometry isn't just a piece of geometry. It's, um, it's kind of a smart surface because it, uh, you can store attributes on the geometry itself. And the same is true for these height fields. So when you run the erosion, all these different channels are stored inside it as basically as, as floats. So um, each one of these layers just becomes a, a value uh, that is, varies over the course of your geometry uh, or your height field. And then all these different channels uh, can be used to drive new things. So for instance, you could use them to carry on uh, 
affecting the erosion further, or you could use them to determine, for instance, like where you want to scatter debris. Uh, so in this case, you know, putting rocks in just in where the debris should go, um, or also vegetation. So there's, these are both being driven by erosion channels. Uh, you can also drive the scattering by other um, information to take off the mesh, such as slope and height. But in this case, uh, I was using the erosion to power that. And then, of course, the erosion becomes really important um, when you get into building your shader. So this is uh, a look at the shader inside Redshift. Sorry, I'm not very good at making clean uh, networks, especially in my shading. Um, but the idea here is that the um, uh, Redshift shader is reading terrain uh, information and uh, using that to power where different bitmaps appear. So for instance, I have these three different texture maps that are coming from uh, Quixel, from Megascans, and I'm applying those as uh, triplanar map textures and repeating them and whatnot. But where they appear is driven by um, masks, which come from the uh, erosion layers. So for instance, um, the sharp, you know, jagged rock would only really want to come in where I've got particular types of rocks in the erosion channel. So I've got a mask that drives that. Um, you can see I've got a math range node in there that kind of allows you to um, kind of uh, tweak the intensity of the erosion channel so you can kind of vary um, how sharply a, a one of these textures comes in. Uh, and just these three materials was actually enough to build a pretty um, detailed sandy landscape. I'll show you here. And um, this is just one of the tests I built originally. Uh, all this is about kind of, you know, understanding how we could achieve a big sense of scale, how we can get a sense of a really big area. And so, um, yeah, it's just those texture maps that are um, uh, masked through the erosion layers. So obviously you have one bit where it's sandy and another bit where it's rocky, and then, um, you know, slight variations in the rock depending on uh, different uh, erosion channels. And um, I think I said before, these are, these are triplanar mapped, so I'm not actually using any UVs or real, um, uh, you know, custom projection here. Everything is just getting mapped um, along each axis and then blending. So, you know, as it comes in from a top-down projection, then it um, gets blended with the side projections as it comes in. And that's uh, pretty good, actually. It works pretty well. What it definitely avoids is any real sense of distortion over, over corners without you having to do any um, UV work. Um, and then, you know, mapping the, or uh, playing with the scale and the repetition of these uh, tileable textures. So you get different variations of that. And then of course, these also get used in powering things like displacement and bumps. So the whole thing works together pretty well. Then there's the um, stra stratified rock pattern that I wanted to get. And this doesn't use uh, the erosion. It just uses the height of the, um, the height channel from the height field. So, um, this comes in as a float value. I think in this case, it was something like negative 50 to uh, 200, something like that. Um, and you can remap those any way you like. In this case, then I just take that into a range node and change that from zero to one. And that allows me to put it into a ramp. And then I can just um, get these horizontal uh, stratified kind of color changes just by changing the colors in the ramp. You can see I've got quite a few going on there. And that works pretty well in, um, uh, you know, just creating that sense of um, those different uh, erosion layers and those different, you know, showing time kind of wearing away at, at your surface. So all of this takes a while to build. I think it probably took at least a week to kind of run through one iteration of my uh, landscape and, um, you know, get it to a point where I felt like it really had the things I needed, the right scale, um, the right kind of level of detail. I think getting the detail level of detail is tricky because if you don't get enough in there, it can look pretty cheap, and so uh, and definitely not real and definitely not big. And I think that was um, the big challenge in here. So it took about a week to build this whole system, but then of course the the massive benefit of having built this um, as a process rather than as a kind of custom geometry. So if you look over on the right, you can see pretty much the whole process from the moment that. Uh, ZBrush model is brought in at the top all the way down to the bottom. Um, and that's basically it. If you then change what comes in at the top, you'll get a lot of the same things uh, filtering through. And I'll explain kind of how that works in a second. We had, um, we had a few kind of creative challenges on this project. Uh, the first was that the, uh, the client 
Uh, they're based in Doha in Qatar. And uh, they were very self-conscious about not being seen as a channel that was based in the desert. And uh, whilst we're making all these different idents based in uh, different parts of the world, they said in this one, please don't, you know, just whittle it all down to us being in a bunch of sand dunes because it will make us feel um, simplified. So they were keen to use the sand metaphor. They just wanted us to find a way to kind of bring in this uh, much more varied terrain as well. So I spent quite a while kind of messing around with how to integrate sand dunes and rocks and whatnot. And um, to be honest, that was pretty fun. Uh, that wasn't really that that painful at all. A uh, slightly trickier bit was just how to bring in this logo shape. The, um, the logo needed to kind of be there uh, fleetingly. Like we just wanted you to be able to see it for a moment and then kind of almost have it disappear just by moving the camera or, or changing the light. So you just kind of didn't really think that you were seeing a representation of the logo in the, in the sand dunes. And, you know, we didn't want this to feel like Lord of the Rings. We wanted to feel kind of, you know, cool and, and interesting. <laughs> I'm not saying Lord of the Rings isn't interesting, just wanted to feel quite, uh, you know, plausible, I think. Um, we had another problem with the logo is that um, for a long time, it was looking like something that it was not meant to look like. And, um, uh, you know, sometimes you just see something in there and you can't unsee it. So we spent a long time uh, trying to mess around with the logo and, and get it to kind of, you know, feel like really kind of embedded in this landscape and interesting. And you can see we, we tried a lot of different stuff. And, um, you know, if you work in motion design or design, you know that anytime you're dealing with somebody's logo, whether it's, you know, just a, a 3D extrusion of a logo or, a, um, or something like this, where you're putting it into a landscape, you should expect to be spending a lot of time on it. So that's where the procedural nature of this process really came in handy, was that I was able to mess around with the logo shape quite a lot without feeling like I was starting again. So these are just some of the sketches I did in ZBrush. And you can see it varies from kind of the one at the top left, which we eventually went with, uh, one at the top right, which is a lot closer to what the logo really looks like, um, which was probably too close. And then some other stuff I was just trying down below. And what's great about this is you don't really need to make a massive commitment to these. You just try them. You just output them and bring them in. And of course, if, if this were for another project where I just wanted to make a very large, uh, expansive landscape of the same types of uh, rocks and mountains, you could create all kinds of stuff pretty quickly without really doing that much more work. So basically, once you bring those logos back, or sorry, those uh, forms back into uh, Houdini, uh, it takes about 15 minutes for all the kind of erosion simulations to be run again. And then everything else is there. The, the shader is, as long as your level values haven't changed too much, the shader will automatically hook up with what you've done because it's all procedural. Um, the scattering will pick up and um, you know everything will pretty much work. It takes about another hour to kind of go through and just figure out where little things just got broken or, or something's just not quite right. Maybe you have to tweak some values in the, in the range mapping and whatnot. But um, uh, it was quite easy to bash through quite a lot of these and not get uh, you know super frustrated, which you might do if you are actually actually having to build these by hand every time. So this is um, this is the one we went with in the end, and um, this is after it's been through comp and um, and sort of softened up, given a lot of uh, kind of scale and all that and added to it. And uh, so that's the diversity one from the Al Jazeera project. There, like I said before, there are five of these, and four of them were CG. So um, if you want, have a look at our website. That's the uh, address up there. Um, or just come to our website anyway. It's pretty cool. Uh, come and see you know, more of these. You can watch all the films individually. Um, and pretty soon, uh, I imagine we'll be doing um, a behind the scenes on this as well. And just before I finish this section, I'd love to uh, shout out to the people who helped work on this, um, the other artists, uh, Anthony Tosh Fieldson, and, uh, or Tosh, uh, and Nikita Shestikov, and also uh, Ross Urian, who did our um, concept frames for this. Uh, they were amazing. She made a tremendous impact on that. So that's the Al Jazeera project. I'm now going to move on to the next thing. Okay, so this is really different. Uh, this is uh, something I've been working on for a while as, as a purely as a personal thing. It's not been for a project, um, but I've been having some fun with it. So um, several years ago, I was just messing around and uh, I could see uh, in Houdini that I could create something that felt quite a lot like paint strokes. And of course, the, the cool thing with Houdini is whenever you make something, you know, you, you can stop thinking about it as like 
a scene or a, or a, you know, even a, a project, you can think of it as like a, a tool or a plugin. So uh, I started imagining how I could kind of exploit this and, and make something that could, could do a lot of different things. So these are just my experiments uh, kind of with how I could create the kind of controls that would make something feel like it was an oil painter working. And um, so I put in a control that meant that, like, as you draw the stroke, the, the harder you push down, the wider it, it made it. So it's picking up on the, the tablet pressure and, and creating a, a width of stroke from that. And um, I wanted a way to, uh, you know, create kind of a high res, res and low res version where I could, you know, quickly switch between the two just to make it a little more tactile and faster. Uh, you know, just basically work in a, in a more realistic way. I, I was thinking about things that I saw in uh, in paint strokes. I, thought, well, I really like the way you get this kind of sense of build up along the front. So um, I was playing around with, you know, how do you make this sense of kind of, there's like more of this at the front of the stroke and, and how messy should you make that? Create that sort of blob at the front. And you know, yeah, how much kind of distortion should you throw in that? You know, should you make it, uh, you know, feel like you got kind of, you know, brush with tons of paint on it. Maybe you're going to use like a, a, a palette knife or something like that. Just, you know, create these controls that give you those, that freedom to try that stuff. And um, I really like messy paint strokes. So I was trying to figure out how I could create something that looked, you know, really kind of, kind of frantic and uh, expressive. And like, you know, even though it's being made by a computer program, you know, feel pretty human. And, um, you know, like, you really get a sense of somebody's thinking or, or mood when they're painting with this thing. And, um, and then of course, you know, the way that uh, oil paint picks up different colors from a palette, I wanted to, to build that in there and, and see if I could make it feel, you know, genuinely like what it feels like, you know, when you get that kind of lovely sort of kind of random mix of colors that just somehow works. And I also wanted to be able to sample colors from a picture. So starting with a photograph, you know, turn that photograph somehow into a point, into a painting. And I think there's all kinds of interesting things you can do with that. You can, uh, you can either make something that feels, uh, almost like an Instagram filter, or you, you can, you know, actually like, uh, you know, hand craft a painting, but doing it in Houdini where, uh, you don't have to get paint all over yourself. So, um, you know, when I start a project like this, I try to figure out like, what is the essence of the thing I'm trying to copy? And obviously, um, you know, looking at this, this is just crazy. Like, where are you going to even, um, you know, start to copy this in CG? There's just so much going on that feels kind of expressive and human. Um, and so, you know, you just start breaking it down and, um, you know, look for basically the patterns. That's like, the first thing I think when you think of procedural work, it's like, well, how do you find the, the thing that repeats or the thing that feels like there's a kind of mathematical logic to it? And um, you kind of get a sense if you look at these pretty carefully that really it's just, it's just somebody who's made a lot of strokes down on a canvas with kind of quite a big variety of, of motions. And if you break that down, you know, those strokes themselves, there probably aren't that many of them and they probably aren't really that complex. It's it's the uh, the distortion and the color and the sheer number of kind of bristles and stuff like that that makes this feel really complex. So I just start taking it down to like the simplest thing you can imagine, which is just a path, right? So, you know, strokes follow a path. So if you just start literally with a, basically like a, a pen path in Houdini, and then to turn that into a, a 3D stroke, uh, you need a thing called a sweep. Um, so I built a setup where basically strokes uh, draw as paths and then they get swept with a, a short line. And as I showed you before, you know, I wanted to be able to vary the width. So that's actually pretty straightforward. You're just bringing in um, an attribute that comes in the uh, draw curve SOP that will um, store the pen pressure. So you have to use a Wacom or something like that. But then that pen pressure is just translated into the width of the cross section of the path of the stroke. Um, now this one shows pretty kind of fundamental way of doing something like this is, is where you kind of make one thing control a lot of things. So 
I have this uh, control called bristle count, which is just controlling the amount of strokes there are, uh, or the amount of cross sections there are in the geometry. So the more, the higher the bristle count, the kind of more dense the mesh is. And um, that's sort of the first thing it controls. And that allows you, of course, for this thing to be, uh, you know, kind of properly displaced like a brush stroke. Uh, so there it is, uh, you know, so it's basically controlling how many points are in the cross section. So basically that bristle uh, count is just driving that um, point setting, but it's also driving a noise uh, frequency. So let's see if I can show this a bit better here. So this noise pattern is what's pushing the bristles up. So basically by controlling the frequency of that noise pattern, uh, by the same control, by the bristle count, um, you get sort of two things happening at the same time. And then this also feeds into the color. This is the color one. So basically the uh, mixing of the colors is dependent on how uh, the frequency of that noise. Uh, this is the control for the uh, leading edge. And you can see they're just controls that are basically determining, uh, you know, how high this thing goes, how far down the stroke it goes, and then how messy it is. And basically all this is doing is kind of just limiting the effect of a noise pattern. Uh, and I just mess around with the noise intensity and frequency, and then this is just pushing up the stroke. So we see it's red here is where the gradient is allowing it to lift up. The wobbliness uh, which I looked at before, uh, it's just distortion which pushes the whole stroke kind of horizontally along the canvas. And again, it's just controlled with the strength and frequency of a noise pattern. So the stroke is only displaced horizontally along the canvas and we can just control you know, how far and, and how big those shapes are that are distorting it. Uh, now, I've been talking about these custom controllers uh, that make all this happen, and they've got names that describe what they do. I've got ones for the brushes and ones for the color and whatnot. That's all coming from this uh, custom interface up here. So basically, I'm just you know connecting these controllers um, and saying, well, this this one controller might connect to several different things within my process. Um, but by just using a custom controller, you have access to pretty much everything. Color is a similar approach. I just created some color controls and then use these to color various parts of the stroke. And the key here is to run them through that same noise pattern that was driving the distortion. And the way that that way the colors, you know, they feel linked to the bristle shape as well. They don't feel like they're just kind of arbitrarily smacked on there. Um, and I put in a switch to change the color mode. So you can basically lay down the color as you draw, or you can sample the color from an image that's underneath the strokes. And the key thing here is that each stroke only samples the color once. So it's not gonna change color over the course of the stroke because that wouldn't really feel like a, uh, um, a brush stroke. That, and that would probably look more like kind of a video filter on top. And once you've done that, you get something uh, all put together that looks kind of like this. You can see it right over on the uh, right-hand side that it's got uh, actual relief to it. There's, those strokes are coming up off the canvas and um, which is something I really like. I love the, the, you know, the relief of an oil painting. I think that's something that really sets it aside. Um, and you can kind of go mental with this until you've got something that's um, you know, bigger and bigger. And uh, this, is, uh, this is one I made earlier. Uh, and this is all uh, you know, hand strokes applied, um, but the strokes are done, you know, the drawing of the tracing over the top is done without the actual paint stroke applied. Um, otherwise that would just take ages. Um, here's another one. Uh, sort of landscape. So this kind of, um, this is sort of version one of this whole thing. This is where I got to. And you can see, you know, drawing something like this, all these um, manual strokes that I made. And um, I've decided that, uh, you know, this is cool, but it's, you know, if you're going to do this digitally, why not, you know, do it like properly digitally and, and let the computer or the system handle a little bit more of this work. So I started looking at kind of the, the different versions of these out there in the world. Um, these are uh, some images done by uh, an artist called Mario Klingman. 
and these are done using uh, machine learning uh, to apply, uh, I believe, to to take kind of portraits and turn them into these kind of interesting oil paintings. And this is sort of what a what a machine would do, what a computer would do. And um, I wanted to do something kind of similar, but I wanted to keep the, the subjectivity of an artist in there. I wanted to feel like I could you know, still heavily influence this thing if I wanted to. I think sometimes with AI stuff, it's like you kind of hand it over to the computer and then that's it. You don't have a lot of like your own interaction with it. It's kind of exists in a black box after that. And I wanted to figure out how I could make this sort of more my own thing. Uh, so here's a little bit of, of what I did next. So uh, these are not my oil paintings, but they're kind of an example of um, how I think an oil painting looks, uh, an oil painter looks at an image. So you take, you know, something that you're seeing and, and you start to find all these, what I call these islands of color, or these little shapes, shapes of color. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's kind of how I imagine an oil painter would analyze an image. They'd find these shapes and then they would replicate these shapes. So what I wanted to start out is how to figure out how to create these little islands. So um, this is an image that, uh, that I'll be working with. Um, and I use a, a node in Houdini called Cluster. And Cluster can read attributes in a geometry and then group them together, group points together based on sort of similarity between those attributes. It's kind of like if you said, oh, I'm going to take a group of 100 people and say, I'm going to group you into 10 groups based on height. That would be one uh, group of 10 clusters. Or I say, okay, now I want to put you into 10 clusters based on age. Um, in my case, I did uh, uh, seven clusters based on color. So basically, these are the clusters in that image um, based on color. And I've smoothed them out a tiny bit. And even already, I think that's kind of a cool thing to look at. It doesn't look like anything like the original photograph, but I think it's quite interesting. Um, so those are the clusters. And um, what I did next was I, I took them and turned them into outlines. So this is one of the outlines from one of the clusters. And um, you can see that it's got a, a pretty interesting shape in it. And it, you know, it feels a little bit like if you quantize an image, like you just break it, you take an image and take it into kind of 10 steps of color, like an index color or a PNG. Um, but there's a lot more in there, I think, is just because the, the outline of that shape is quite interesting. I think you can, you know, figure out how to make that feel less digital and more artistic. So the first thing I did is um, followed a, a process I learned from the guys at Entagma about how to replicate lines uh, in a space. Because they want to create something that's a little bit like a kind of contour map in this space. And basically what this does is it takes a, um, an attribute that's stored on the lines called tangent u. And it puts that into um, a volume and stores it inside the volume as velocity. So basically those little um, yellow lines you see there are getting in my system uh, brought into a volume where uh, that those yellow lines are then stored as velocity, almost like um, you know wind pushing around inside this volume. And then when you run uh, another node inside the volume called uh, volume trails, you get um, repeated lines. And suddenly you start to see something that feels kind of artistic, almost like, um, you know, like someone's uh, sketched it or engraved it. Um, there's definitely some repetition in there that feels a little bit digital or, I don't know, maybe a bit like almost Van Gogh or something like that, but um, that can easily be messed around with. And once you get all that kind of repetition in there, um, those basically become the paint strokes. Those are become the guides for the paint strokes. So here you see uh, what happens when you put them on for all the clusters together. And um, if you apply the color to that as well. And, um, you know, there's, it can look a little bit like a mess, but if you look carefully, you'll see there's a logic to it. There's a kind of, those little islands are in there. And I think that's the difference between just sort of arbitrarily throwing a lot of, um, different noises in there and getting lines drawn around. Is this, this feels like it's linked to something in the original color of the image. And you can see there's sort of these patterns drawn around the eyes and um, there's, uh, you know, these kind of cool little islands on the chin and on the cheek and the whole, uh, the nostril is feeling, um, you know, quite quite real in the way that the, the strokes are draw, drawn around the nostrils all quite cool. And, um, if you apply the uh, effect that I just built to it, uh, the stroke it effect, this is what you get. And um, it's pretty cool. I think, uh, you know, this is a, a very quick 
kind of tested. I think it's all done in about 15 minutes, but, um, and I had to fill some gaps in Photoshop, by the way, it doesn't completely map the whole image. Um, but uh, you can see how it's, um, you know, it, there are really bits in there that feel like uh, they were painted. And um, so my goal next is to kind of add a little bit more expressiveness into this and find a way to, um, you know, get a, get a kind of um, efficiency of stroke that, a, that an oil painter would use where, um, you know, a single stroke can convey so much more information. Whereas here I've got a kind of a very even balance of strokes throughout the whole painting. This is the uh, interface that I set up for this. Um, so basically, um, this is a kind of additional setup to the stroke thing I built before, and just allows you to load in an image, set the brightness of it. You can crop it, reposition it, whatnot. It's very quite interesting if you do multiple layers at different crops and different resolutions and stroke densities, you get um, a really cool kind of um, variation of stroke width and what that. Um, stroke density is just how many of those little lines you get in there. The stroke width is is how wide the uh, the stroke it is. the stroke it stroke is I'm saying stroke a lot. Um, so this is um, this is my uh, kind of landscape approach. Um, this is also done basically just using the exact same technique. Um, you can see there are a lot more kind of big strokes in there. I tried to um, you know kind of emphasize the the depth and and the weight of the paint in there. See if I could get that across a really like kind of expressionist, uh, sorry, impressionist um, landscapes and where you really see the, the paint building up on the, on the canvas. Um, There's another one, uh, my daughter running on a beach. And again, I just really wanted to get the sense of, um, you know, the, the buildup of paint in there. I think it just needs a little bit more kind of uh, experimenting with the efficiency of stroke like I was talking about before. And then this one is, um, uh, you know, quite different. This is actually based on a photograph, based on a photo of a flower. And you might be able to see a flower in there, but I just kind of let it go nuts. And um, I really like it. I like the way that it it feels quite, um, it, feel, it still has a lot of depth and intensity and it, it feels a little bit frantic, um, but it also still, you know, feels kind of like a flower. So that's, um, that's my paint tool. And that's the end of the stuff I'm going to show you today. Before I go, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, I want to sort of pay tribute to a couple of people, or three people, in fact, who've just really helped me get my head around Houdini and get working. And this is the, um, Manu and Mo from uh, Intagma, and um, also um, Matt Stella from uh, CG Wiki. Uh, these guys have, you know, well, the guys from Intagma have kind of opened up, I think, Houdini to the design world by, by kind of showing us the tools that we needed to make the kind of stuff that we were used to making, and then how to take that a lot further. And um, I, I know these guys personally as, as friends, and I'm just uh, really grateful to them for having set this all up. And Matt, um, who I've never met, but uh, would love to one day, uh, he runs the CG Wiki, which is like an encyclopedia to me. It's just been so uh, critical to me, uh, sort of breaking down systems and understanding what works and what doesn't. And, you know, I'm not really a particularly um, experienced Houdini artist. I, do, I work with a very sort of small set of tools with inside of Houdini. But um, <laughs> what I do know, I've... I've learned largely from these three people. So thank you very much, guys. Um, just before I go, uh, please have a look at the Mills website. It's got all kinds of cool stuff in there um, and their Twitter feed as well. Uh, and also you can come look at my website. You can see a lot more about the Stroke It stuff there. And you can also uh, see me on Twitter, uh, very active on there. And please feel free to uh, drop me a line and say hi. Uh, and uh, have a great day, and um, we'll see you when, uh, when everything gets back to normal. All right. All the best. Bye-bye.